quickly welcome everyone here virtually as um, to the International Menopause Society, our webinar called the Heart of the Matter webinar. I'm Dr. Cassandra Schufelt, Professor and Chair of the Division of General Internal Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Florida and Associate Director for the Mayo Clinic Women's Center for Health Research. Today we have two presentations and then we will open it up for questions. I would ask that you put your questions in the Q&A. You can type them in as the lectures are going, but we will be addressing them and holding them till the very end. I would also ask that you indicate which scientist or professor you would like to address the question to, or if you don't have a specific person, then we will open that up just for discussion. The first presentation will be given by Professor Nappi, entitled Traditional and Female-Specific Cardiac Risk Factors. Professor Nappi is full professor of obstetrics and gynecology, chief of Re the Research Center for Reproductive Medicine and Ge Gynecological Endocrinology Menopause Unit and IRCCS San Mateo Foundation, University of Pavia in Italy. Dr. Nappi's major interests are the field of psychoneuroendocrinology of the female reproductive and post-reproductive life with a special focus on women's sexual health. She is our past president of the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, ISHWISH, and at present, she is a permanent member of the advisory board for the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology and of the International Academy of Human Reproduction, and she is our president-elect of the International Menopause Society. The second presentation will be given by Dr. Matthew Nudy, entitled Assessing Cardiac Risk Factors in Midlife Women. Dr. Nudy is a practicing non-invasive cardiologist at the Penn State Hershey Medical Center, where he serves as an assistant professor of medicine and public health sciences at the Penn State College of Medicine. Dr. Nudy's primary interest and his research interests is in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease prevention, specifically studying methods to determine risk prediction and novel risk enhancers in postmenopausal women. I look forward to both of these presentations, and I would like to um, also acknowledge that this is a webinar supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Bezen Healthcare. Bezen Healthcare has no role in the selection of the topics, selection of the speakers, and have not vetted or reviewed the content of our presentations today. So with that introduction, I would like to take uh, the time to introduce Professor Nappi with her first talk. Thank you, thank you, Crisanda. Uh... Hello to everyone. Uh, I put my presentation on screen and I think we see. Here we are. So my job today is to revise with you all uh, the traditional and female specific cardiac risk factors. And I will offer you the point of view of an OBGYN working for more, so many years uh, in women's health. Uh, the first concept that I want to share with you is really that we are here at IMS webinar because uh, menopause transition is the golden moment to uh, assess cardiovascular disease. Uh, you are uh, perfectly aware that endocrine and metabolic modification are tightly linked at menopausal transition and specifically contributes to a worsened cardiometabolic profile in women which is independent from the aging process. And we usually consider two very important risk factors at this time. They are specific to women, especially diabetes. That is a stronger risk factor for cardiovascular disease-related death in women, more in women than in men. And also, we will see a little bit high blood pressure. You all know that the lack of estrogen leads to many different consequences for cardiometabolic health. The most important ones are depicted in this very simple cartoon we produce with Peter Cidrao, Irene Lambrini Dacu, and Tommaso Sibicini very recently in uh, Lancet Endocrinology and Metabolism, in which we revised this issue together. And we pointed that visceral fat is absolutely important together with insulin resistance. And there is a, a strong connection be, between these two events. 
they can lead to all the bunch of alteration. On one hand, that is lipidemia, on the other hand, inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, oxidative stress, and uh, hypertension. They all contribute to the cardiometabolic risk. But what we have learned also over the years is that we have a unique opportunity at the time of menopause to, to uh, try to identify those women that are at higher risk. And in this cartoon, we summarize what we know from the seminal study of women's health across the nation that is giving us so many information about women's health longitudinally and we realize that as menopause physician, we can do a lot because when we identify women, they are highly symptomatic, meaning they have a persistent or moderate severe vasomotor symptoms over time. We can identify a cluster of patients that usually have more risk factor to develop cardiometabolic risk. Uh, for example, uh, women, they have a higher body weight, higher waist circumference, lean body mass, uh, more insulin resistance, less favorable um, uh, lipid profile, uh, hypertension, et cetera. But it's not the only uh, factor in reproduction that is so related to cardiometabolic health. In this little panel, we summarize what we know about uh, some conditions, they are very common in the OBGYN obstetric and gynecological history. And we will touch some of them more in details, the one we have more solid data. Let's start by the bottom. Uh, what happened at midlife and what happened when women enter early menopause, surgical or iatrogenic? And uh, we can include in this group also women with premature ovarian insufficiency, even though on them we have a, a little bit less data. Our model is surgical menopause, and this model is out there since so many years. These are data from the Framingham study, and you see it was back in the 70s, in which we realized very clearly that when you enter menopause at the, at the right age, but you do it uh, abruptly, you significantly increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. But especially when you enter early, you see before 40, between 40, 44, uh, in between 45 and 49, that it seems quite normal, but you double the risk, you triple the risk, and you have a risk that can go up to a sixfold greater when you compare postmenopause with uh, premenopausal women. So this is a solid information in uh, our literature. But what I would like to convince you today is that we have to change that traditional paradigm in which we believe that there is something before menopause in which women, they don't have any risk, and something after menopause in which you have a strong increase in the risk. Menopause is important, of course, but we have to look at, at, with, in, a, in a different way, meaning that we have to consider that the risk in women is increasing over time since the very beginning of their life. And I will try to, to convince you about this. I want to go back a bit to history of uh, uh, gender cardiology. Because one of the major problems we have in clinical practice is still a problem uh, that women, they do not recognize too much their uh, cardiometabolic risk. And I want to quote this fantastic uh, woman I met 20 years ago in the United States. And she was the one saying to everybody, also to gynecologists, that we don't, we don't need a bikini approach. Uh, to women. We don't have to think about uh, the reproductive system and the breast as the major only organ we have to check. Uh, but we have to consider the rest of the woman as part of women's health. And why she was saying this is so aloud to everybody? Because at that time, you see, that was this wonderful report in which uh, the Americans, they were focusing on this concept that one in three women die from heart disease. This is probably 
still true also at the present time. And there is no awareness about this. And this is another friend of mine from the cardiological ward at Lori Mosca. At that time, she did a survey that was very, very important because they were able to demonstrate that the reality of what happened to women is cardiovascular risk and cardiovascular mortality, but the perception is completely different. And women that believe they will die for, from breast cancer and not because of cardiovascular risk. And it's very important to, to uh, be uh, very active in prevention. Why this? Because as soon as a campaign in the United States started in 2003, Go Red for Women, they were doing so good to their patients. Why? Because women, they became aware of their risk. And so to be aggressive on a cardiovascular risk factor for women can make a big difference. But even though we are doing quite well, this is still probably not enough. And also we have to consider that until now, women they die more than men for cardiovascular disorders, ischemic heart disease, you see it's more uh, or less 20% of this cake, stroke is 13 and other cardiovascular condition 16. So there is still a lot to do uh, on the, in this business. Another very important concept that we have out there is that cardiovascular disease and mortality is present also, also in women. They are not so far uh, away from the menopause because you know very well that we are always saying that women, they take longer to develop the cardiovascular risk factors because they have the protection of estrogen until the time of menopause. But we have to underline that all over the world, there are some women, unfortunately, they die because of cardiovascular condition, even in the segment between 50 and 69 years. And so not only in the 70 uh, plus. And this is very important and focus our attention on the need for prevention. There are many differences in terms of sex, but also in terms of gender risk factors. Of course, we will focus our attention today only on the sex, but we know that if the perception, uh, the cardiovascular risk is not typical of women, even physicians, they may be delayed doing some kind of uh, investigation on women or they do not recognize if they are not well-trained uh, the risk factor, they are typical of women, for example, the clinical sign. And also we have data out there suggesting that women, they are under-treated. So sometimes there is a delay, sometimes there is an under-treatment. And this is the reason why we have to recognize those factors, they are in the medical history of women, they can help us to identify high-risk patients. We have discussed already about premature menopause. We have to discuss other, other conditions now. So I hope I convince you that being a woman is not a modifiable risk factor. And we have, as in the title of my talk, some traditional risk factors that are common between men and women, and some they are more peculiar or they are unique to women. And they have mainly to do with the reproductive history and the most common condition we, uh, we know is uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, but uh, the one that uh, they have more solid data, they are the condition, they are associated with pregnancy, gestational diabetes and uh, um, gestational hypertension. Also, we have other uh, conditions, they are common in women, uh, such as, for example, uh, combined oral contraceptive use, or some conditions, they are more common in women than in men, such as, for example, autoimmune disorders or migraines that can be considered additional risk factor specific in, uh, in women. It's very important we underline in general that there are some differences according to the gender uh, in terms of women disadvantage for cardiovascular risk factors. And the most important one in women, the one we should be more aggressive 
in terms of a, a generic uh, risk factor, traditional one is a smoking on one end, and on the other hand is diabetes. Because both uh, these uh, risk factors, they are more relevant in women than in men. On one end, the coronary heart disease you see from this uh, analysis and uh, even, uh, even for stroke. So these two conditions are relevant. Sometimes it's not so easy to recognize uh, how much hypertension is important for women. Why? Because there is an overlap. And this is true also during pregnancy. We will see there is an overlap between hypertension and other risk factors, such as obesity, insulin resistance, as you know very well, they are all part of the metabolic syndrome that is the antechamber of diabetes. And so we have to consider all these factors together. But there is absolutely no doubt that at midlife, some women more than others are at higher risk of having change in, in particular in the sympathetic activity that encompass all these risk factors together because we know that sympathetic overactivity is present not only in hypertensive patient but also in patient with obesity, with vasomotor symptoms and so on. And there is no doubt that at the time of menopausal transition, something happened to blood pressure in women. And there is a significant subset of women. They are at higher risk of elevation of blood pressure, in particular, diastolic blood pressure. Of course, that time it passed from menopause to 60. So in that particular moment, the increase of cardiovascular disease in women becomes evident. And this is relevant to our discussion because Women around the age of 40 should be uh, checked. And when you check, what kind of women you should check more? The one they have some risk in their, uh, in their uh, obstetric and reproductive health. Diabetes is very important and is the condition we are focusing more as OBGYN in general. Um, you will see it during pregnancy. Why? Because diabetes really makes a big difference. And I want to share with you also this old uh, data that so clearly depicts the fact that when we have women with diabetes, we have a significant increase. The numbers are amazing in comparison to women without. But diabetes is a, a risk factor for many conditions, uh, not only um, coronary heart disease, not only stroke, remember also vascular dementia, and end-stage renal disease, and also we have to consider a cancer. So for an OBGYN, diabetes is uh, something we should target uh, for, for sure. And to recognize diabetes in the medical history of the woman, the diabetic risk can be extremely easy if you listen to the general history of the patient. Here is a very simple cartoon that summarizes all this concept together. And you see very clearly that you may have different risk factors. We have already explored on the left part that the, the menopause issue or premature ovarian failure or some risk factor that can amplify uh, the risk of endothelial dysfunction, such as the smoking. But you see on the other side of the cartoon, we can have a subset of women uh, during their fertile life, they have a polycystic ovary syndrome, especially the one in which the condition is comorbid with insulin resistance or obesity. These women, they are the one, they are more prone to develop also complications during pregnancy, especially gestational diabetes and preeclampsia. So if we collect an accurate uh, uh, medical history, we can recognize the women, they need a more aggressive care. And so, as you know very well, right now, we have many, many cardiogynecologists, cardio obstetrics. They follow women after uh, delivery because of this higher risk. Of course, uh, the risk is higher in women. They are the so-called metabolically unhealthy and obese women. 
But remember that obesity by itself, also when you are metabolically healthy, for a wide range of reasons, they can put women more at risk. So we have to consider uh, other aspects of uh, uh, obese women, they may be related to uh, cardiovascular risk. Think about abstract, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, other uh, alteration in periphery artery disease, etc. So we have always to be very well balanced, keeping in mind that other condition they may we may target, for example, a physical activity that is a condition that is so important to promote uh, uh, general well-being in women and even cardiovascular health. And is particularly striking to observe that sarcopenia is a stronger risk factor in women than in men. And so we don't we really need to, to handle with lifestyle medicine this risk in women. We recognize early they may develop over time cardiometabolic risk. You see in this cartoon, this is very beautiful because we see very clearly that in male, uh, low muscles and high fat, they make a big difference, whereas in women, this is not the case. The big difference is also present when you have low muscles and low fat. So women should be targeted in a different way, probably. And according to this paradigm that we have now in the literature, as soon as we recognize that a woman, she has polycystic ovary syndrome, and we recognize, for example, that for other conditions, she can enter menopause early. We should be so smart to block this negative vicious circle that will lead over time to all the steps we know so well. They may be, for example, in the case of polycystic ovary syndrome, androgen dependent. May, may they may be dependent on many other mechanisms according to the, the risk factor of the woman that they will end up at the end of the day when women, they will be over 40 to higher risk for hypertension or diabetes. So my dear friend, we really need to start very, very early and we build up our cardiovascular risk since the first stage of our life. I believe that we have to consider now also the concept of transgenerational medicine. This is very important because if you are born from a mother that she developed gestational diabetes or she developed hypertension and maybe she, she had polycystic ovary syndrome, you will gain more risk factor for your future life. And we have plenty of data supporting that. And this risk is really for the mother, of course, if she has a one of these conditions, but it's also for the baby, especially when develop some kind of complication from gestational diabetes or preeclampsia. Think about, we always think to large babies for gestational age, they are also at higher risk, but the one they are at higher risk, the real higher risk, they are the preterm birth or the small gestational age pregnancy, because this baby, they are little lower than 2,500 grams, they are themselves at higher risk during their own life. And so this vicious circle is so important to understand the future risk. Another little point I want to touch is depression. It's a, it's a big topic, but keep in mind that depression is uh, higher in women than in men across the lifespan. It's very common also during postpartum. We have uh, plenty of data suggesting that there is a, a, a link with the cardiovascular risk for many reasons, of course, not only uh, hormones, but also genetics and psychological factor, uh, behavioral habits, and so on. And we have to consider when women, they are postpartum, and they are at high risk of depression, they can develop also specific risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So ladies and gentlemen, we really need to follow women across the lifespan. We have to collect uh, the history, really the, 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 the birth at, uh, the, the body weight at birth 
because uh, we know we have data now suggesting this long chain, that it's a chain that starts from the uterus, it goes throughout menarche, goes across pregnancy. And when you see the woman in midlife, you collect all this kind of programming that you have. So it's not only your genetic, but it's really your epigenetics that counts. And when we revise uh, the literature on many other aspects of reproductive life, you see this is a very nice umbrella review I want to share with you, in which there are many other information of the reproductive history that are important. Some data are solid, some data are less solid, but you see that when you consider all the study, we really recognize that PCOS may be a risk factor, moderate severe preeclampsia is a significant risk factor when you consider composite cardiovascular disease. Premature ovarian insufficiency is confirmed. You see preterm birth is there. Even the length of the reproductive lifespan can play a role in terms of having early menarche. Uh, as a, a potential uh, also risk factor, not only early menopause and so on. So we have all this information to be, um, to be collected in our medical chart in order to understand better for the future. We have more or less the same picture for ischemic heart disease, for some, um, uh, for some reproductive factor, uh, it's really strong. Look, think about uh, recurrent preeclampsia, so we really need to be aggressive during pregnancy to prevent uh, the recurrence of preeclampsia when you think about uh, cardiovascular risk factor. And also another very interesting information that is recurrent miscarriage. Keep in mind recurrent miscarriage can be strongly linked to uh, autoimmune disorders, to thrombophilic risk, and so this is a very important piece of information to uh, collect uh, in, uh, in, medical, in medical history. We have also data on stroke. Uh, some data are less solid, but you see that preeclampsia is confirmed and recurrent preeclampsia is really confirmed as a risk factor and even preterm pre birth. Here you see how is strong that preeclampsia, recurrent preeclampsia. I think this is the, the most solid data we may say in this uh, business and heart failure, so strong, so important information, you know, is retrospective data when we interview women, but women, they usually remember this data. And it's interesting also to observe that there are some data that really point to a link between discourage and stroke, and we should elaborate more because we don't have so many recent data on this, uh, on this topic. Stroke also related to gestational diabetes, uh, not so strong, but it's there to be seen. And the last uh, condition I want to mention with a very old uh, study, but I know that our chairperson can elaborate more on this because she's doing wonderful research on this topic, is a condition that we do not associate so much to uh, cardiovascular risk, usually in clinical practice, because we believe these women, they eat well, they exercise, they are the women having functional epithelamic amenorrhea. But you see, this is a study I like very, very much, because it was my first reading on this risk of hypothalamic hypoestrogenemia in young women, they develop. So premenopausal women, they undergo an invasive um, exam to, uh, to assess the risk of uh, uh, myocardial ischemia. And these women, they are, have hypoestrogenemia. They develop more cardiovascular condition, and this is strongly related to estradiol. So also this uh, uh, may be less common condition should be uh, considered in the medical history of a woman we want to target for prematurity prevention. And so I will end up my talk and giving the floor to my colleague that is a cardiologist, uh, reporting you the, the two more recent documents. They were produced, uh, and this is, was a joint venture 
between European cardiologists, gynecologists, and endocrinologists. And in this nice cartoon, you see all the information I share with you. So we really need to identify women. They have an excess cardiovascular risk due to pre pregnancy disorder, due to menopause, due to other endocrine and gynecological condition, and more information we collect, more data we can use for real primary prevention. And we really need to address the cardiovascular risk, being very active in monitoring blood pressure, in assessing, for example, the risk for metabolic uh, syndrome and uh, pre-diabetic condition in all these categories of women. Why we have to do this? Because according to the other big uh, societies, the American Medical Society and Cardiology Society, all the people we have in here today with Chrysandra and Matthew, we really need to be smart to send to the internal med medicine doctor or to the cardiologist earlier this kind of women, because probably these women should be treated in advance. And so I hope I have convinced you that specific sex cardiovascular risk factors exist in women, and we really need to be smart enough to collect this information in our um, women's health clinic and uh, we really need to have a strong communication between gynecologists, primary care physician, internal medicine doctor, and cardiologists. And with this, I thank you very, very much for your attention. So first and foremost, thank you to Dr. Schufelt for the introduction, and thank you to Dr. Professor Nappi for the uh, excellent presentation. So my name is Matthew Nudi. I am a a cardiologist at Penn State University uh, in the United States. And I'm going to be lecturing today on assessing cardiovascular risk in midlife women. I have no disclosures to report. <clears throat> so here are the objectives for my presentation. There are three of them. So the first is to discuss atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or ASCVD risk assessment tools and understand their indications and also understand their potential limitations. The second objective is to review the role that coronary artery calcium scoring may have in reclassifying ASCVD risk and guiding preventive strategies, including pharmacotherapy. And the third and final objective is to examine a new potential ASCVD risk stratification tool for women using an incidental finding on mammography called breast arterial calcification. And there have been two prospective studies published within the past year uh, on this topic, one of which I was an investigator on, and we're gonna review those later on in this presentation. So first and foremost, I wanted to define some terminology for cardiovascular disease prevention. And the first term that I wanted to define is primary prevention. So primary prevention is the prevention of a first heart attack uh, or a first stroke in the setting of CVD prevention. The second term is secondary prevention. And this refers to the prevention of a second or recurrent heart attack or stroke. And there's been a newer term in our literature recently, and that is called primordial prevention. So primordial prevention is the prevention of cardiovascular disease risk factors, and this typically applies to younger adults. For this presentation, I'm mainly going to be focusing on primary prevention uh, and risk assessment tools, uh, and some of what I talk about also applies for primordial prevention. I won't be talking about risk assessment for secondary prevention populations today. <clears throat> Uh, so this is a figure from the 2019 ACC AHA primary prevention guidelines, and this is the A, B, C, D, and E's of primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And you'll see that A is assessment of risk, and assessment of risk is really the cornerstone of primary prevention. We're essentially assessing the risk of an incident ASCVD event 
And the idea is, is that we tailor our preventive therapies uh, to the risk that a patient has for future AFCVD. I briefly wanted to review the traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And I know Professor Nappi touched, uh, touched on these as well. So these include diabetes, elevated blood pressure, obesity, tobacco use, hyperlipidemia, age, and family history of premature cardiovascular disease, which is typically defined as less than 55 years in a man and less than 65 years in a woman. And as Professor Nappi mentioned in her presentation, these cardiovascular disease risk factors typically affect women differently than men. And as an example, women with diabetes have almost a twofold higher risk of cardio cardiovascular disease compared with a man with diabetes. I also wanted to touch on the risk enhancers for cardiovascular disease. And these come from the 2019 ACC AHA primary prevention guidelines. In 2021, ESC also released prevention guidelines. And most of these are referred to as risk modifiers uh, in the ESC guidelines. So these include South Asian ancestry, uh, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes like preeclampsia, preterm delivery, also premature menopause, uh, inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriasis, HIV, and also certain lipid biomarkers and inflammatory biomarkers. And our guidelines state that we can use these risk enhancers after assessing for cardiovascular risk to determine if a patient should be on a preventive therapy. That has a 2A level recommendation uh, in the ACC AHA guidelines. I next wanted to talk about primary prevention assessment of risk. So we typically assess risk in asymptomatic adults between the ages of 40 and 75 years of age. Um, we don't apply these risk assessment tools to patients that are younger than 40, uh, patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, or patients that have profoundly elevated LDL cholesterols. In patients under the age of 40, uh, there is a 30-year risk assessment tool or a lifetime risk assessment tool, and that carries a 2B level recommendation in our guidelines. We routinely assess cardiovascular disease risk factors and calculate 10-year risk using the pooled cohort equation. And I want to specify that's in the United States. The pooled cohort equation has been validated in populations in the U.S. The ESC uh, prevention guidelines uh, utilize a, a, a risk assessment tool called SCORE, or Systematic Coronary Risk Evaluation. Uh, SCORE is validated in populations in Europe. The pooled cohort equation estimates the risk of hard ASCVD events, and this includes coronary death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, and fatal and non-fatal stroke. I also want to point out that that score uh, is validated for uh, fatal cardiovascular disease and is not calibrated for non-fatal cardiovascular disease events. There are various factors that go into the pooled cohort equation, and that includes age, sex, race, blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, diabetes history, smoking status, blood pressure treatment status, uh, statin use, uh, and also aspirin use. And we really use this risk assessment to decide on initiating statin therapy and also to decide on initiating antihypertensive therapy for patients who are at elevated risk. It is important to know that there are limitations of the ASCVD 10-year risk assessment tools. So the pooled cohort equation can underestimate risk in certain subgroups, and this can lead to under-treatment in patients that would, would require a treatment for prevention. These populations include patients with autoimmune disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis and sarcoidosis, also patients with HIV, uh, patients at socioeconomic disadvantage. Uh, in addition, the pooled cohort equation can also overestimate risk in certain subgroups uh, and lead to overtreatment. 
And these subgroups include patients at higher socioeconomic status, patients with continued access to care and preventive services. Uh, the pooled cohort equation may be suboptimally calibrated in modern populations, as this risk assessment pool was uh, calibrated in older populations. And also the performance of the pooled cohort equation in diverse racial and ethnic groups from outside of the United States is really highly var variable. And there are a lot of studies testing the pooled cohort equation in other populations. Here's just one example. Uh, this one example is from the Korean heart study. So this included over 200,000 uh, adults from Korea aged 40 to 79 years, and they were free of ASCVD at baseline. And they calculated the 10-year ASCVD risk in these patients utilizing the pooled cohort equation. And what they found was that in men, the risk was overestimated by over 55%. And in women, the risk of ASCVD was underestimated uh, by 28%. Uh, the Women's Health Initiative also assessed the predictive accuracy of the pooled cohort equation in postmenopausal women. So this particular study looked at over 19,000 postmenopausal women. And essentially what they found was that the observed risks of ASCVD were lower than what was predicted by the pooled cohort equation. There was a subgroup of participants over the age of 65 where they were able to bring in events adjudicated by insurance. And when they did that in the subgroup, uh, they found that the 10-year ASCVD risk from the pooled cohort equation uh, more aligned with what was observed in postmenopausal women in the Women's Health Initiative. So when we estimate 10-year ASCVD risk, uh, there's really four categories that a patient could fall into. Uh, patients with a risk between 0 and 5% would qualify as low risk. Patients between 5 and 7.5% would qualify as borderline risk. Those between 7.5 and 20% qualify for intermediate risk. And those with a risk greater than 20% qualify for high risk. And once clinicians assess the risk of cardiovascular disease, there really should be a clinician-patient discussion uh, after considering some of those risk-enhancing or risk-modifying factors that I had talked about earlier to determine if a patient should uh, be recommended lifestyle modification to prevent ASCVD risk, or if they should be recommended to have lifestyle modification and drug therapy. And you'll also see that if uncertainty remains, a clinician and patient can consider a CAC score uh, to re revise and re-stratify a patient's risk. So that is what I'll talk about next, and that's coronary artery calcium scoring. And this is to assess for subclinical coronary atherosclerosis uh, with a CT scan. Uh, CAC, or CAC or coronary artery calcium has been shown to be superior to biomarkers and also carotid intima media thickness uh, for the prediction of future ASCVD events. And for those with intermediate risk between 7.5 and 20% risk of ASCVD, or those with borderline risk between 5 and 7.5, a CAC score can be used uh, to revise risk uh, and essentially determine if a preventive pharmacotherapy should be initiated, uh, such as a statin or an antihypertensive agent. What I will say is this has a 2A uh, recommendation uh, in the ACC AHA guidelines, and it has a 2B level of recommendation in the 2021 ESC uh, prevention guidelines. And it is noted in, in both of these guideline statements that there is no randomized control trial um, designed to detect differences in ASCVD events uh, that has shown CAC to be beneficial. So as I mentioned, risk can be reclassified. So if the CAC score is greater than 100 Agustin units or at the 75th percentile of age, sex, and race, uh, the risk would be, um, would be an, an upward reclassification. And if the CAC score is zero, it would be a reclassification downward. Uh, it is important to note that the radiation exposure uh, for one of these CT scans to get a CAC score is about one millisievert, uh, which is equivalent to a, a screening mammogram. 
I did want to highlight a study called the Multi-Ethnic Study of Atherosclerosis. So this was a prospective cohort of 6,800 uh, adult participants between the ages of 45 and 85 years old. About half of the participants were women. All of these patients were free of clinical cardiovascular disease at baseline, and cardiac CT scans and CAC scores uh, were obtained at baseline. Participants were followed for a mean of 11 years and were followed for ASCVD events. So here's one of the result figures from uh, the MESA cohort. So the left panel represents women and the right panel represents men. The y-axis of this figure represents cumulative incidence of hard CVD events, and the x-axis represents years since baseline. Um, the CAC score is stratified at zero, which is the light gray line, uh, one to 100, which is the darker gray line, 101 to 300, which is the even darker gray line, and the black line represents a CAC score greater than 300. And what you can see here is that participants with a CAC score of zero their risk of ASCVD events over the follow-up time of this study is low. And this dashed red line represents a 10-year ASCVD risk of 7.5%. And you can see that those participants with a CAC score of zero stay below that 7.5% risk line. I also wanted to highlight that the Women's Health Initiative also has an ancillary study, which is published looking at CAC scores in postmenopausal women. Uh, so this was an ancillary study that included just over 1,000 participants from the estrogen alone randomized clinical trial, and cardiac CTs were obtained about one year after the clinical trial ended, and participants were followed for about eight years after the CAC score was obtained for incident cardiovascular disease events and also mortality outcomes. Uh, this is just the outline of the study design. You can see that the mean age when participants got their CAC, uh, their CAC score was 64.4 years, and it was after the randomized control trial. Uh, what they found was that 54% of the participants had a CAC score of zero. 27% of the participants had a CAC score between one and 100, and 19% of participants had a CAC score greater than 100. Here are the results from the study. The y-axis of this figure represents age-adjusted rate uh, in 1,000 uh, patient years uh, for various ASCVD events, including CHD, stroke, cardiovascular disease, angina, and coronary revascularization. And the events are strat stratified uh, by CAC subgroup. And you can see that for those participants with a CAC score greater than 100, their risk of experiencing ASCVD events is increased. And here's the second uh, part of the results uh, of this study, looking at their mortality outcomes. And you could see that all cause mortality and CVD mortality increase with increasing CAC scores as well. I wanted to pivot in the presentation and now talk about a potential novel marker of ASCVD risk in women. Uh, and this entity, entity is known as breast arterial calcification. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, there have been two prospective studies published within, within the past year uh, looking at BAC or breast arterial calcification. So <clears throat> medium-sized arteries in the breast can become calcified and subsequently visible on a mammogram image. Uh, the drawing on the left represents the medium-sized arteries which are present in the breast. The image on the right represents a mammogram image, and you can see calcification where the white arrows are inside of the medium-sized arteries. And the calcification is a medial layer calcification and almost appears like a tram track appearance uh, on the mammogram. In the United States, radiologists typically do not report BAC on mammogram reports because there's no known association between BAC and breast cancer. <clears throat> there are a lot of lower quality cross-sectional studies in the literature uh, assessing associations between BAC, cardiovascular disease risk factors, and cardiovascular disease events. These cross-sectional studies are overall mixed in their results. 
Uh, I did want to highlight this pr prospective study, uh, which is the high, probably the highest quality prospective study on the topic. Uh, it's called the Minerva study. So Minerva enrolled uh, just over 5,000 postmenopausal women between the ages of uh, 60 and 79 years, and they were recruited into the study uh, after the participants attended a screening mammography uh, session. These participants had no known ASCVDF baseline, and <clears throat> BAC mass uh, was measured on the mammogram study uh, utilizing a novel densiometry technique. Uh, they found that BAC was present in 26.5% uh, of participants at baseline. Uh, and these patients were followed for a mean of six and a half years uh, to assess for hard ASCVD events, including myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, and cardiovascular disease death. <clears throat> what they found was that BAC was associated with an increased risk of incident ASCVD events with a hazard ratio of 1.51 and a 95% confidence interval of 1.08 to 2.11. Uh, they also calculated baseline ASCVD risk scores utilizing the pooled cohort equation in these patients, and they added BAC status uh, to the pooled cohort equation. And what they found was uh, they noted uh, improvements uh, in calibration of the risk score when BAC was added to the pooled cohort equation. They also noted that they were able to reclassify patients based off their BAC status, and it improved the risk prediction of ASCVD in the study. Uh, there was an additional uh, prospective BAC cohort uh, that was published recently uh, that I was an investigator on. So we assessed just over 1,900 women who were arriving for a screening mammogram, and we followed them for the development of coronary artery disease and stroke. Uh, the mammograms were assessed at baseline for the presence or absence of a BAC. Uh, we did not utilize the densiometry technique to measure back mass. And what we found was that <clears throat> a BAC on a screening mammogram was associated with an increased risk of coronary artery disease. And that includes myocardial infarction, cabbage, PCI, and abnormal angiogram. And it was also uh, associated with an increased risk of stroke after 10 years of prospective follow-up uh, compared to women who had no BAC on their screening mammogram. Uh, and interestingly, when we looked at all of the standard cardiovascular disease risk factors at baseline, and compared it to BAC, we found that BAC was most strongly associated with the development of coronary artery disease, and it was more strongly associated than some of the standard CVD risk factors, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, age, and family history of premature CVD. So the take-home points from my presentation, one is that cardiac risk assessment is the foundation for primary ASCVD prevention, and we use it to guide pharmacotherapy in individuals that are at high risk of experiencing incident ASCVD. Uh, there are potential limitations that exist in certain subgroups uh, for our risk assessment tools. Certain subgroups may have an underestimation of their risk, and while other subgroups may have an overestimation of their risk, Coronary artery calcium scoring can be a useful tool to reclassify a patient's risk of ASCVD and guide potential pharmacotherapy, including statin medications and antihypertensive medications. <clears throat> and finally, there may be a novel ASCVD risk stratification tool, uh, breast arterial calcification, uh, which may be implemented in the future to improve ASCVD risk assessment in women. Uh, thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Wow. Well, thank you both. This was very thought provoking. And I, I, I really do love the term transgenerational. And I'm going to start using that. And it really speaks to the fact that there's so many more novel and sex specific risk factors for women that we really need to consider from things like, you know, gestational birth, weight, to now things that are happening incidentally from screening from other diseases. But um, it really does speak to the fact that we're a lot more is certainly needed. So I'm going to have Dr. Nudi unshare your um, 
your screen so that we can go ahead and open this up for um, some excellent questions that are already coming through that I'll moderate. Um, the first question, and we'll have about a few minutes to go over, and there's a few questions that I hope everyone can stick around for and answer. Um, the first question is for Professor Nappi. Um, again, it was a wonderful presentation. This is a, an, an, a Professor Nasiri, Nasirin from Bangladesh. So um, wondering if, uh, just would like to know if it is routine to assess the risk of cardiovascular disease in women before prescribing hormone therapy, menopause hormone therapy. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello, dear friend. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I believe uh, we really need to take uh, the prescription of menopause hormone therapy seriously. And I believe that we uh, have to keep in mind that we should prescribe to symptomatic women. They are, uh, uh, they are in need of our care. This is the first reason why we have to. Of course, if these are symptomatic women, they have also risk factors that we believe can uh, interfere with the safety of what we are prescribing. We should work at uh, in pair with other specialists, unless we are very, very well skilled in the field of cardiometabolic health. Because I really believe that, uh, you know, we, we can discuss because you know that uh, there are so many people, they are afraid of prescribing menopause hormone therapy, but we know that when we use uh, natural estradiol, for example, transdermally, or when we look at the data we have from the WHI, keep in mind that a reduction of diabetes, more than 20% only with estrogen, more than 10% with estrogen progestogen, we have to keep in mind that this can be a preventive weapon we have in our hand. But of course, we should use as a, as a primordial prevention because I learned this new word from Matthew, and this is very, very important, meaning that when a lot of risk factors are there, probably we should be more careful because otherwise we go into that condition that cardiologists and internal medicine doctors, they say that it's useless to use menopausal hormone therapy and you can even cause some damage. But we have learned that you cause the damage when the person is old, when she has already a condition that you cannot reverse. And we have to believe in the window of, of opportunity uh, theory. Uh, I didn't go into de these details because uh, of course it was not the topic of my talk, uh, uh, menopause therapy, but for sure we have to give to symptomatic women at the very beginning. And probably we should start even early during the pre-perimenopause. As soon as women, they have the symptom, we should stabilize their hormone with natural estradiol, and if we can, with natural progesterone. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Nudi, I'm gonna have one over for you. So this is uh, Jane Adams, and why is hormone therapy not recommended in women with high-risk cardiovascular disease or even previous cardiovascular events? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. Um, so hormone therapy, uh, we, we typically don't recommend it when patients have had a prior cardiovascular disease event, uh, because when we look at the randomized control trial data uh, in participants who have known ASCVD, uh, there seems to be an increased risk of stroke uh, and also an increased risk of uh, systemic embolism, including pulmonary embolism and DVT. Um, what I will say is I, I, I have looked at all of the randomized control trial data, uh, looking at systemic hormone replacement therapy uh, in trying to stratify it by patients in a primary prevention uh, population. And essentially what I saw when I did that analysis uh, was that there doesn't seem to be an increased risk of cardiovascular disease uh, in younger individuals. Uh, but when looking at older individuals and individuals that have prior CVD, uh, there may be a, a, a signal of increased risk. Great, thank you. Um, the next one is from Dr. Naftalin from Yale. And this is a, I'm gonna throw this to Professor Nappi. Since visceral fat is more predictive of cardiovascular disease risk, isn't it really time to discard BMI 
in favor of estimating that? Thank you, Fred. It's so beautiful to know that you are there. Uh, you are absolutely right. As you know, we are discussing so much now in research that the, 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 the parameter that is better related to, to the risk is uh, waste, uh, the waste measure and not the BMI. As you know, BMI is a number that has been out there since so many years. And there is this classification, uh, overweight, uh, obesity, severe obesity, etc. But uh, for sure, the future will be body composition, because we really believe as well that the ratio between the muscle and the fat is so important, especially for women, and we should do no we should know more about that and the waste. Uh, it's easier, you know, to ask to a patient, what's your body weight? What's your age? And instead of measuring the woman. But we should start doing that in our office and also to recognize those patients that are at higher risk longer before the menopause, because this is my goal for the future, you know, to, to really study this segment of population, women over 40, uh, with risk factor related to pregnancy, with risk factor related also to infertility. And when you have these women out there, you can recognize the phenotype of women they are at higher risk. And when a woman has already waste, that is uh, at the waist hip ratio is not favorable, so it's a more androgenic waist hip ratio, we really need to be aggressive and maybe to start using for those women, they had PCOS in the past with hyperinsulinemia, maybe low dose of a treatment. Think about a so cheap metformin, for example, or other strategies, because we really need to do lifestyle medicine, diet, exercise, and also some preventive drug. They are so easy to, to be prescribed and they can do some good in primary prevention, really. Uh, you know, I'm not a, an expert in primary prevention, but I believe that uh, lifestyle medicine should be in every women clinic and in every OBGYN department. Yeah, and, and I will um, roll the next question into that lifestyle medicine um, comment that you just made and agree completely that, um, and this will be for Dr. Nudi. This is, uh, I'm gonna put kind of two questions together that you make such a good case for multifactorial contributions of cardiovascular disease risk. Um, you know, one is specifically about, is it necessary to use anti-cholesterol therapy when it's only the total cholesterol high that's high? And then the other one is, is what is what are your thoughts on a poly pill approach to midlife women's health? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll uh, answer the first part of that question. Is uh, an anti-cholesterol medicine necessary only when the total cholesterol high is high? I think that's an interesting question, and it's probably something that would be decided on on a case-by-case -case basis. I probably would want some additional information, like what is the patient's 10-year ASCVD risk? What other CVD risk enhancers does this patient have? Uh, also, I'd be interested, interested to know what the patient's LDL cholesterol is. And if this particular patient had an elevated total cholesterol and also had some CVD risk enhancers with shared decision-making, um, you know, it, it may be reasonable to initiate a statin medication in that patient. It's kind of difficult. Just yeah. If I could just follow up on that, and I think that the USMHA menopause position statement and the menopause transition as a risk factor for cardiovascular health really does speak to the fact that um, H HDL, and this is study data from the SWAN, is not as protective as it, as it is during the younger years. So the total cholesterol does take that into account, but I think we need to also rethink about the different fractions and how they're metabolically active in a woman as she transitions through menopause, because oftentimes I'm so often heard, well, you've got such good HDL, you don't need to go on a medication, even though your LDL is a little bit high. So I think it's not just also focusing on the total cholesterol, but looking at all the subfractions. And I think that's an excellent point. And no, more research is needed specifically, but um, I'd, I'd like to hear both of your comments on a poly pill for um, multifactor of contribution to cardiovascular disease. That'd be great. So, I, I mean, there have been some good randomized control trials 
uh, of poly pills for the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, and some of them have been very effective uh, for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, I think it, it, it's probably most beneficial and most helpful in populations where adherence is an issue, uh, where it's an issue where a pa patient can't take multiple medications. Uh, I do also think there are some limitations to some of the polypill studies that have been published. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about an example of a polypill study uh, that was published sometime in 2020, uh, which included aspirin for primary prevention uh, in some older patients. Uh, and this was published after uh, we had some newer data from 2018 uh, showing that aspirin for primary prevention may be harmful in older individuals. Matthew, I want to ask you something. You know, I was thinking as an OBGYN, as you know very well, right now we are doing some kind of algorithm to estimate the risk of gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. And when this algorithm is positive, we uh, supplement the pregnancy until 36 weeks of gestation with a low dose aspirin. And it works yeah. very well. So mm. probably for the future, uh, to collect uh, also this information uh, for our patient when they enter the, the, the age in which they are at risk can be useful maybe to stratify a population that can benefit more than another from that kind of prevention, you know, because uh, uh, it's not all the same. Some, for some people, it works better to reduce uh, insulin resistance for other people, to reduce coagulation, et cetera, you know? And so we should really focus uh, on uh, uh, the, 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 the gestation, I think, uh, uh, to understand better in which direction we should uh, uh, plan our prevention with drugs. This is my thought. I don't know, what do you think about yeah, it? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, I think it would be uh, very interesting uh, to study aspirin for primary prevention in women who have a history of adverse pregnancy outcomes. That would be very interesting. Great, um, we're gonna have time for just a couple more questions. And, and this one, um, I'm gonna throw this back to the fact that JAMA article came out on November 1st, which is the US Preventive Service Task Force. And it's an evidence report for hormone therapy for primary prevention of chronic conditions in postmenopausal persons. And the question, is from Ricky Polycove that how do you reconcile the recent uh, US task force JAMA opinions and lack of evidence for menopause hormone therapy prevention role? And I will speak to the fact that they did conclude that there was the use of hormone therapy in postmenopausal persons for primary prevention of chronic disease was associated with some benefit. So they did recognize that there was some benefit um, specifically for fractures over five years, but also associated with increased harm. So that was the conclusion and relevance for the, the but I'd, I'd love to hear both of your comments on that. I'm very sorry for them because they don't understand that really our point the way we look at this field. First of all, I believe we cannot say postmenopausal women. Doesn't mean nothing, postmenopausal women. There are certain menopausal women, they have a great benefit. And this is what we, what we learn looking at the data and looking at our practice. If we stratify patient according, first of all, to symptoms and also, of course, uh, to age. If you put everything in the box and you believe that menopause hormone therapy is a magic bullet that will solve all the problem, this is not the way it works. And unfortunately, we speak a different language. You know, overall, I can say, okay, it's true, it's not the magic bullet to prevent chronic disease. But in certain population of women, at least four, uh, osteoporosis prevention is the most powerful tool I know, but if I look at my patient, they are on 25 years of uh, uh, hormone therapy, how do you are fit? And probably it's not only because they are taking hormones, it's because we are taking care of them. They are taking care of their health, they are eating better, they exercise more, they are less depressed. So it's a bunch of reasons. They are around the consultation in the menopause office. This is my view. Uh, yeah, and uh, 
some of my thoughts, just thinking of this from a, from a timing hypothesis perspective and cardiovascular disease, um, thinking about all of the randomized control trials uh, in patients at, at, at baseline who are on average younger than the age of, of 60 years old, uh, there is actually an all-cause mortality benefit uh, and also a cardiovascular disease benefit. Uh, I do know when the open label randomized control trials are excluded from that analysis, the cardiovascular benefit uh, disappears, uh, but the all-cause mortality uh, benefit persists. So that's kind of my opinion uh, on the matter from a cardiovascular disease. Outstanding. Well, that is what the time we have today. I will like to thank our speakers, um, Dr. Nudi and Dr. Professor Nappi for giving such eloquent and outstanding lectures and really thought provoking that this really is a risk factor that really needs to start much earlier. And we really should be focusing a lot on lifestyle and primary prevention and, and preventing the risk factors before they even start at the time of peri and, and menopause. So I would um, like to thank our audience. Thank you for being here and being interactive in this in our new era of um, of webinar. And I would appreciate the fact that you've all given us excellent thoughts and questions. Thank, thank you, you so Sandy. much. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Have a wonderful <laughs> rest of the day.